Hello, Buddhist geeks. This is Vincent Horn, and I'm joined today for a Geeks of the Roundtable discussion. And we've got a couple awesome geeks joining us today to speak about eco dharma. Um, so I'm joined today by David Loy. David, good to have you on the show again. Thank you, Vince. Good to be back. Good to see you. And uh, also with Lama Willa Miller. And uh, this is the first time we've had you on Buddhist Geeks, and it's uh, great to be here with you. Great to be here with you too. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah. So. We're here today to discuss, uh, I think it's a really important topic, um, the relationship between uh, Buddhist practice and the ecological, uh, David, you call it the ecological crisis. I mean, and that's a, a kind of strong way of saying it, I think, but it, it's also a very important way of saying it because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in our, uh, in our world right now. Right. Well, sometimes ecological crisis, I didn't think I'd get a plug so early, Vince, but uh, the... Um, <laughs> Uh, ecological emergency. Sometimes that's the title of our uh, our book that uh, John Stanley and I uh, put out a few years ago, a Buddhist response to the climate emergency. Yeah. So so this is something, David, that you've been writing about for quite a while, probably before it was cool. So, so, so <laughs> it was one way to say it. Um, it's definitely uh, warm now, but um, you know, before it was warm, you were talking about this stuff. Um, and uh, you know, and, and David, we've had you on the show before, so I think some people know about your work. You're also a Zen teacher and philosopher and writer. You spend a lot of time um, writing about the kind of confluence of modernity and 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 Buddhist uh, thinking right. and practice, um, right. at which this is a clearly important area. And then uh, Lama Willa, you, um, you you know, you're the founder and director of the Natural uh, Dharma Fellowship, um, and have an awesome retreat center out in the out in the woods called the uh, Wonderwell Refuge. Um, so, you know, you're a teacher and um, doing all kinds of interesting work there. And, and kind of one thing I wanted to highlight is that uh, you're organizing a conference there on this very topic, Ecodharma. It's happening this summer, um, mm -hmm. August 11th, uh, 7th through the 11th. And kind of bringing together a bunch of people to talk about this, this issue, yeah? That's right. Yeah, we're, we're organizing a conference that we've named the 2014 Ecodharma conference and um, this is actually the second time we've held a conference of this sort but the first time in 2012 we kept it quite small and uh, just invited a few people that we happen to know personally in the Northeast with the with our eye to do something larger the next time and so now's the next time this year we're um, hosting this conference from uh, August 7th to 11th of this year and uh, inviting quite a lineup of speakers. So we have some featured guests such as uh, David Loy uh, who is here with us today and also Bika Bodhi, mm -hmm. um, well-known translator and scholar who has also written about climate change, uh, so we could say sort of the, the theology of the climate emergency, talking about how uh, Buddhism can, how we can frame it, how Buddhism can help us frame this situation and our response to it. Um, Angel Kyoto Williams uh, is one of the guests and also Kirti, a climate scientist who's coming to join us from Boulder. Mm -hmm. um, other guests are um, Patrick Groneman who has been affiliated in the past with the ID project and uh, mm, there are others as well. <laughs> I think I better well, look know, it up. <laughs> people can check it out. And, um, yeah, work. check it out at wonderwell.org. Wonderwell, yeah. I'm sorry, wonderwellrefuge.org. And if you go there and you scroll down on schedule, you can see the full lineup of speakers. We're very excited about the conference, and we're hoping to bring together, we're bringing together climate scientists, activists, and Buddhist teachers and leaders in their communities to talk about um, to talk about a collective response to the climate emergency that um, takes into account uh, that climate change has ethical considerations and, and is an ethical issue. Yeah. So we'll be discussing uh, climate change from all perspectives. Yeah, that's cool, and you know that's a, an approach that really resonates with with us here at Buddhist Geeks because, you know, it, it seems like the only way to really respond in some sense to these complex issues is to, to get everyone at the table, you know, all the important voices and, and hear what they have to offer each other. Um, 
and that's one of the you know that's what where really I want to start off with this conversation because we're dealing with two kind of major areas you know we've got the ecological movement and the activist movement on one side mm -hmm. and then we've got the Buddhist movement on the other and meditators and you know people interested in their uh, you know kind of uh, consciousness experience and and the sense of identity and suffering and things like that and in some ways they seem like really really different areas yeah, different scopes and different concerns mm -hmm. and yet um, you know in this conversation we're bringing them together and that's kind of what I wanted to ask you guys you know what what do each of these areas have to offer each other um, in my experience every perspective is limited every perspective has like certain things that it sees and certain things that it's blind to mm -hmm. um, so it, assuming that's the case um, you know maybe we could start with the most obvious one since the people are listening here are interested in Buddhism you know what is Buddhism as a practice and as a tradition hopefully as a living tradition have to offer um, the sort of ecological movement and some of the kind of very troubling challenging um, next few decades that we have ahead of us with respect to climate change and um, all sorts of issues and you know feel free whoever wants to jump in and try to respond to that massive well, question first. Well actually be, before we get into that one I'd, I'd like to back up a little bit and just just mm. say a little bit about how I think it's kind of the natural fit uh, between what I see as the traditional what highest ideal of the Western tradition focusing on social and social transformation including I think finding ways to address the kind of ecological situation we're in now I mean I think there's a long history in the West of built on the realization that we can restructure our societies if we don't like the way that they're working and we can restructure our technologies and and economies as well and then that coming together with the Buddhist emphasis on on, on personal transformation you know um, mm -hmm. the way Buddhism developed in the West or sorry in Asia um, it, it didn't focus on social transformation it didn't have much to say about political how we reorganize ourselves that that for the most part wasn't an option for for the people in Asia but so Buddhism has done this wonderful job of sort of developing all these technologies or let's say practices techniques that can help us transform ourselves and likewise I think in the West we're very aware of um, the possibilities of, of social transformation of activism that can enable that and so I see it as kind of a natural fit together where now that Buddhism comes to the West it can sort of develop its its possibilities and likewise I think we can see pretty clearly at this particular time in history that we're not really going to get where we need to go we're not going to experience the kind of transformations we need if we just think about transforming structures transforming social political ways of living together we also need the personal the individual so the reason I wanted to back up Vince was I, I think that that's the kind of larger dialogue between Buddhism and modernity that I'm really inspired by mm. in general and I see the ecological crisis as one of those f f aspects today that makes that conversation so urgent mm. Okay. You know, that, that I think we need the best of both traditions if we're really going to be able to address the ecological crisis in the way that it needs. Something mm. like that. Mm. Mm. Great, great. Thank you. And uh, Willa, do you have any, have any thoughts on, I mean obviously you do, on the kind of the way that Buddhist practice, because this is where you've really been grounded for the last, I don't know how many decades, but I'm sure it's been quite a few, um, on, on the ecological side of the street. Mm. Yeah. I. Well, I feel like one of the things that Buddhism has to offer um, this conversation is that, uh, you know, similar to what um, David was saying, we focus on inner, inner work and inner transformation. And so if we can say that if Buddhists have a specialty, you know, he, he, David, you were talking about um, the Western specialty being this idea that we can restructure, a confidence that we can restructure our societies. If Buddhism has a kind of confidence, it's about restructuring of the mind and the heart. So, um, and that kind of inner cultivation of strength and uh, qualities of being that can be very helpful for activists, uh, especially activists that are uh, engaged in such a 
huge and uh, in, a, in a way overwhelming and despairing sometimes mm -hmm. issue. Um, so having tools to work with that involve both working with that, we could say, eco-despair and transforming mm -hmm. it into uh, joy and activity uh, is a specialty of Buddhism, what to do with suffering and how to transform it. And, and then also um, there are practices in Buddhism of, of cultivating compassion that I think could be very helpful for the activist community. Um, practices where we actively deepen our sense of love for sentient beings can be pretty uh, adaptable to love for the environment and love for ecosystems and um, being able to turn that into a practice that's not just conceptual but that is embodied and um, and, and joined with some spaciousness, I think could be very helpful uh, in conversation with, with activist uh, actual on the ground work. Mm. I'm, I'm curious too, do, do either of you have any sense for how many, um, and I don't need like a specific number, but you know, roughly how many people that are in the activist work have some sort of relationship to their inner lives in that way where they actually have tools and practices. I mean, you all have spent probably more time in those spaces than I have. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious, is that is that becoming more common? Is it common or is this still something that a lot of people are waking up to? My sense is that it's 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 becoming a bit more common than it used to be, but we're starting from, from a pretty low level in the sense <laughs> that I I mean my my sense and my experience is a fair number of activists are are don't find Buddhism very attractive because they find Buddhists often very self preoccupied you know that often we're 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 so preoccupied with our own peace of mind and and some a lot of the activists get very turned off by that so I think there's there's a bit of a challenge there that uh, to us Buddhists to to show that that's not true or maybe to to work so that it's no longer true in the future or something like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I've been surprised at how many activists I've met who have no contemplative practice and and maybe even aren't necessarily drawn to that naturally because you know often activists look at the word activist, <laughs> you know, in some ways we could say contemplatives are are focused on on being and and uh activists are focused on doing and really both of those things are necessary uh, to live in a sustainable ethical uh, beautiful world we need action and we also need cultivation of states of being but um, but yeah this idea of of, of um, I'm sorry I lost I lost track of what you had asked me you know <laughs> no just go just go <laughs> but anyway I think that um, often how we are is just as powerful as what we do. Mm. So um, I've, I've recently been in a circle of women um, who are being sponsored by Clark University, uh, women in the humanities, who are involved in a council discussion about uh, this, um, this climate crisis and it's called the Council on the Uncer Uncertain Human Future is the name of it. And we're just sitting and and really sitting with each other and discussing um, every four four times this year. We're getting together for a couple of days for four for four very intense all day uh, overnight sessions. Mm -hmm. And in that this in that circle, I've met some people who are uh, activists and, and climate scientists, and and not all of them do have a contemplative practice. So I think. I think that it is new to some people, and um, and I do hope it catches on because I think there is, as David was saying, such a great potential there for contemplatives to be in conversation with activists in a way that could really yield uh, a very deep form of activism that's informed by uh, inner transformation and a change of heart. Mm. But you know, it also works the other way around. Is uh, uh, I've I've been just as surprised um, uh, the the indifference or or lack of concern or what can I say uh, when when John Stanley and I uh, uh, edited this this book that I showed a moment ago. It came out 
a few months, maybe half a year before the Copenhagen meeting, we were quite surprised how, how little interest it generated. I mean, mm -hmm. my, my sense, frankly, and I've been sort of following and plugging this for several years now, uh, until the last year, I haven't sensed that the Buddhist community in the U.S. has been any more progressive on this matter than, than, than any other, and, and I would say less progressive than a number of Christian groups. And it's curious, only in the last year or so, a lot of Dharma teachers are now getting very uh, concerned. And so it, it seems to be happening on that level. But even when they go ahead and, like, if you have, if people often retreats on Buddhism and the ecological crisis, the number of to turn out tend to be quite small. Uh, you know, mainstream teachers who want to talk about it find out that a lot of their people just aren't really interested. And I guess I'm really concerned. I mean, I think it's beginning to change, but I, I'm concerned that, and here's one way to say it, that, uh, you know, I think a lot of us Buddhists have found our own way of resolving the ecological crisis. That is to say, when we think about what's happening and, and really follow and get in touch with how serious it is, it, is it, it arouses a lot of anxiety. And I think we have our own way of dealing with that anxiety. We, we meditate and we let it go. And in a way, the crisis is gone for us insofar as we find that quiet equanimity within ourselves and, and that, that, so that we don't allow ourselves to be disturbed by, by, this, by this phenomenon. And, and so I think, you know, Buddhism still has, the Buddhist community still has quite a way to go on this. I mean, I think things are moving in a really positive direction, but uh, it's, it's taken a surprisingly long time, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right on that, and I, I think that um, part of it has been. Um, I, mean, I don't I don't know all of the reasons, but I do think that there there has been an issue in some communities simply with the fact that you know two thousand five hundred years ago there wasn't an environmental mm -hmm. crisis, and so like in these root texts, there's no talk about doing something about the environmental crisis so we have to create our own discourse we have to create it anew and oh. we have to join it with these deep Buddhist ethics of uh, like uh, the ethics of interdependence um, we have a, such a great basis for creating this discourse but it's it's really really new and I think right. many Buddhist practitioners are are still trying to get their their heads around this is a different world a different time and a different oh. set of language a different language and different needs yeah, so, good. yeah. And, yeah. I, and I think what's encouraging if I can just follow up on that is that uh, you know I mean Buddhist emphasis on impermanence and insubstantiality applies to Buddhism itself and we see the way how every, every time Buddhism has spread to a new culture it hasn't just imposed its traditions upon the culture, but it's engaged at the, in a mutual interaction. Mm -hmm. So, for example, my own tradition, my own practice tradition, Zen, right, we know that, that that was something new that evolved out of the interaction between Mahayana Buddhism when it came to China and the native traditions, especially Taoism. And so some, and, and now, I think what we're seeing is the same, the same phenomenon happening yet again, and, and I don't think there's any doubt that the, the, the confrontation with the modern world, it's not just the West anymore, you know, the, the confrontation with modernity is, is, is the greatest challenge I think that Buddhism has ever faced and I think we can expect that Buddhism can be and I think needs to be changed in that interaction in the same way that Buddhism has so much to offer the modern world. So it's a really, really exciting time to be a Buddhist but it's also a time that requires and, and openness to experimentation and transformation, which is going to be necessary if we are going to find ways to help address the sort of situation that we're in today. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, yeah, and I think we're, we're really in a time when we now have evidence that the Earth is sentient. I mean, mm -hmm. only in the sense that everything that we do affects her. And so we've had this, this, this understanding in Buddhism of having compassion for all sentient beings. And I think this is an example of how we have to adapt. Uh, in the past, I think teachers have uh, interpreted this, and it's been interpreted in texts as meaning creatures, you know, the animals, the hell realm beings, and the, 
so forth. Yes, mm -hmm. creatures for sure, mm -hmm. but also where creatures live. And, and so we have to start inc including the earth as a sentient being. When we say those prayers, when we mm -hmm. open our hearts to compassion, and if we do that, then we can, I believe there's a possibility for revolution. How can we stand by when these sentient be this sentient being, this sentient mm -hmm. earth is hurting? Mm -hmm. Just like we couldn't stand by if a sentient being were hurting. So it's not just individual species that we need to be concerned about as Buddhism, but of course, in, as Buddhists, but uh, whole ecosystems. I mean, ecosystems are alive and individual species are, are, are part of that. And, and I think this is a perfect example of what I was trying to t touch on, how, you know, in the last couple decades there's been a lot of work on what is sometimes called the new cosmology or the new story. And this really fits in very nicely, I think, into what Buddhism has to, has to say. Uh, uh, and, and so I think this is something that's going to be, uh, you know, sort of grafted or this is going to be one of the stories that I think is going to have a lot of impact on the way we understand Buddhism, even as Buddhism can help us understand this this new cosmology, which emphasizes, among other things, that we are we are the way that the Earth becomes self-aware. Mm. You know, mm. it, it does that answer that old question about uh, you know when the Buddha woke up? If there's no self, who who woke up? I mean, mm. Mm. there's there, there's fascinating kinds of interaction going on here, which of mm. all of which, of course, have uh, enormous. Uh, ecological implications. Mm -hmm. mm. And so Vincent, you were asking about how Buddhism could contribute to this conversation, um, sort of for, from this conversation with activists. And then another area that I was thinking about is that this is so tied into, this climate crisis is so tied into our consumer habits mm. as nations and as communities and in order to start to, if there's going to be any change, there has to be a change on the level of our consumerism and how we've framed even concepts like the economy. It's going to all be up for question if, if this is really going to change. So, so one thing that I've thought about lately is Buddhism addresses in the Four Noble Truths this question of desire, um, greed and need. It's a big part of Buddhist mm -hmm. discourse. Desire, greed, and need. But do we have to just feed desire, greed, and need? Or are there other things that we can do with it? And I think that is another area where Buddhism could perhaps bring some something uh, of value to the discussion, talking about working with our inner states of need and, and, and the sense of the needy mind. So um, that's another area that I've thought about. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I, I was having a, a, a conversation with a friend late, uh, recently, and he's in the he's in the business sector, and he's he's a young guy and getting ready to go to Silicon Alley in New York and start a big you know incubation program, and he's you know raising millions of dollars and you know really stepping in firmly into both consumer culture and technology culture and business culture and 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 he's aware of all of these issues um, at the same time um, you know my, my challenger question that I posed to him was um, how how in the world can you change those systems from the inside and how in the world can you change them from the outside both seem very difficult if you're whether you're standing right in the middle of it and you're just buying the assumptions of it, or you're stepping on the outside and you're sort of criticizing it, but you don't really quite understand how it works. Um, you know, it seems like you know when it comes to changing these really big systems, that's where you know that's where the rubber sort of hits the road, and and that's where I start to wonder, like, how is this actually done? Um, it, it, I mean, it's clearly not a single thing that we're working on, and I wonder if this is where the ecological movement, you know, which which is focused more on systems. Uh, and changing things like may have something to offer, kind of the Buddhist side of, of the street. The, is your friend a practitioner? He is. Yeah, because yeah. I mean I think that's that's a really important part of it. In that I mean I think what Buddhism, one of the things clearly Buddhism emphasizes is that we have to start with ourselves, right? So uh, 
we come to Buddhist we come to Buddhist practice because there's some dukkha, some suffering there that uh, that impels it. And so, by you know by by dealing with that, I think if we're really engaged in practice in a in a deep and transformative way, it's going to have important consequences for our own consumerism, right? So we're not going to be caught up in the game that you know we we have to measure ourselves against the other Silicon Valley's entrepreneurs and and get the same ten billion dollars that that they that they've gotten. So you know there there's some sense of perspective on on what one is doing and why one is doing it. So there, there's that side to it, but then there's also the other side. I mean, I think is as far as I can see there needs to be some serious restructuring of the way that corporations work. I mean, corporations can play something very, they can certainly serve a very valuable role here, but it's also tricky in the sense that the way they are legally written in most cases, they're rather limited, right? And I think New York and a few other states, including California, now have a new kind of corporate charter that actually allows them to emphasize social responsibility because until that, you could actually be sued. A CEO could be sued by his shareholders for not maximizing, uh, you know, profit, because that's what it's all about. You know, the corporation is owned by these stockholders, etc. So we need new types of of uh, ways of restructuring corporations. I think that's a very important part of it. And fortunately, corporations have a, an umbilical cord. It's called their charters, and and so I I think that that. Uh, certainly has to be part of the process. So, I mean, I think those are just two reflections. It's such no. a huge issue. I, I don't oh, want to yeah. pretend that I, but, but I think those are two important aspects of it. Maybe Willow wants to... Uh, well, you know, I, I feel like I'm still really, you know much more than I do, David, about that side of things. And I'm still learning a lot um, about the, the broader systems. And I do think that is one way that a conversation between activists and Buddhists is so important. So David talked about the passivity that he sees in many Buddhist communities and the lack of, of really taking this issue seriously, taking it to heart, and, and taking personal responsibility for being active about it. You know, so he sees some, some evidence of that. I think the way for that to change for Buddhists is simply education. That it, it, part of it is that we, we just don't know that much yet mm -hmm. about climate change, the science of climate change, the truth of where we're headed, and, and these larger systems like corporate culture and how that feeds into, um, how that feeds into this crisis. We don't know. Uh, as Buddhists, much about that. I would say in the in the Buddhist community, many of us, including myself, are still in a state of of, of some ignorance about those systems. And so, one way that we can start to do something about our uh, moving and 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 shaking more as Buddhist communities is education, educating. Yeah, and you know, David, I remember when we were uh, do doing this short retreat on uh, on spiritual activism. Mm -hmm that one of the things you brought up, and I think it's relevant to, to the point you're making, Will, is um, maybe there's a tendency for those of us who are drawn to contemplation and to, you know, kind of noticing our inner experience and working with it, um, maybe there's a tendency for us to be, as a whole, kind of conflict-averse, you know? Like, we're, we're trying to manifest this loving, compassionate, yeah. you know, uh, right. all of this, and, you know, sometimes that's really beautiful and it's awesome, and sometimes it ends up being a kind of... Yeah. Um, you know, kind of, we're we're actually kind of trying to avoid situations where the yeah. parts of us that haven't been transformed get activated, and you know, mm -hmm. and when we talk about the ecological crisis and we have different perspectives on it, you know, you know, and David and I, we've had many debates and conversations about uh, about these things, and we don't agree on on all these issues at all. But you know, and when it happens, there is conflict, there is tension, there is anger, there is confusion, there is fear. You know, all of those things come up, and and I and I know that you know the Buddhist tradition has many ways of working with them. But I also know that in my own experience that sometimes the way of working with them is like you're saying, David, to to kind of like notice them and let them dissolve, and then nothing necessarily doesn't necessarily come out of that kind of approach to it. So you know, that that seems a little bit problematic in terms of the the interface between these two. Mm -hmm. uh, that. 
I think that's exactly right in the sense that, um, uh, and and I think it pertains a lot to the way that socially engaged Buddhism has developed in this com country. Uh, social engagement in the sense of service, I think, is now largely accepted in in the sense that. Um, Many Buddhist practitioners accept how important it is to get involved with, you know, helping people, maybe helping homeless or working in hospices, working in in prisons, things like that. But when it comes to larger issues uh, of of sort of structural ones that might involve some kind of conflict or dealing with big big oil, for example, then Buddhists feel a lot more uncomfortable. The analogy that I've sometimes used is that I think we've, as you know, Buddhist practitioners we've become better at fishing people out of the water, out of the river, drowning people, but uh, we're not very good at, at, at dealing or asking the question, well, why are there so many more drowning people? Who or what is pushing them in the river upstream, you know? I was recently reminded uh, of, uh, of that famous line by uh, Dom Camara, um, this uh, Brazilian archbishop who said something like, uh, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why there are so many poor, they call me uh, uh, a communist. I, I wonder if there's a Buddhist equivalent. When I uh, when Buddhists give, when Buddhists help homeless people, they are called bodhisattvas. But when we ask why are there so many more homeless people in the richest country in the history of the earth, we're called leftist or something. You know, we're kind of dismissed. People don't want to address it. Sorry, I think I'm talking too long here. But no. the other thing that 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 really comes up for me, and I think this is Bill McKibben who said it, that um, um, if 10% of the people in this country did everything they could to reduce their carbon footprint, you know, probably sold their cars put in solar panels, lived off the grid and so forth. Even if 10% did that, it would make virtually no difference whatsoever as far as what's happening with the carbon issue. But if something like 7 or 7.5% 7 of people became socially active and did everything they could, demanded that we have the kinds of political changes that are necessary, then we could resolve the problem. So this is a real koan. This is a case where personal transformation, reducing our own footprint, our own carbon footprint is really important. It's where we start. But we have to find ways to understand and address larger structural issues, such as the role of big oil, which is determined to, you know, get as much oil out of the ground and sell it as quickly as they can before the changes that they know have to come, you know, are, are going to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also I also think that we could make an argument that um, being socially and politically active as a Buddhist is as old as the Buddha, because the Buddha himself was a social activist, was a political activist in his way. He was so. a critic of the caste system, right? And and to be a critic of the caste system in India at that time can't have been all roses. I mean, I just feel, you look at his, his um, the sutras and the Pali Canon, and, and there's quite a bit of criticism of the caste system there, social criticism. So I think if we really look back at Buddhist history, too, there's many templates and examples that we have of being socially active and, and even politically active when the stakes are as high as, as they are in the, Buddha, in the Buddhist time, the high stakes were the caste system, and equality was his his struggle for equality was around that issue. In our time, I think that climate change may well be the most critical ethical issue of our time. Mm -hmm. So to address it would be a, a, a natural response uh, for Buddhists to make, not not something that is somehow new to get off our cushion in this way. Mm -hmm. And and I have a question, a kind of follow up on that, Willa, for you because um, you know if we acknowledge, you know, in this confluence of, of the modern world and, 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 and this ancient sort of set of practices and injunctions that Buddhism offers, if we sort of acknowledge that this is like one of the most, if not the most critical ethical issue that we face, you know, how does that change how we practice or how we teach Buddhism? You know, is, does it actually require that we redesign or re-engineer the path itself? in order to, you know, give us the capacities and the skills and the tools needed to, to respond to very unique challenges that, 
you know, it's not the caste system per se that we're dealing with. It's, you know, it's sort of eco, you know, it's system mm -hmm. that are kind of spiraling out of control. Well, I, I do think that we have a moral obligation as individuals in the Buddhist community to hold the earth in our meditations. Um, so in that way, adapt our meditations to include um, a wider sense of what all sentient beings means, um, not just all species and all creatures, wherever they are, whoever they are, but the home of all those creatures and, and how they're all connected to each other, an even broader and deeper sense of the interdependence of all things. I think now that we know what we know, about how our actions have changed the earth and are changing the earth. We can't turn away from that knowledge mm -hmm. as, as individual Buddhists. So in our practice, I think we have to bring it into our practice and I do think we have a moral obligation to do that. I also think that leaders in the Buddhist community, I mean I, I don't, I can't speak for everyone, but I think there is I think that our Buddhist communities would be enhanced if leaders brought this issue into their teaching in various ways. So to give an example of something that, that I did recently, I, 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 I changed the sense of the, the four immeasurables, or I played with the wording in the four immeasurables. Um, in a teaching in which it, may the earth have wellness and the causes of wellness, may the, may the earth be few, free of pollution and the causes of pollution, mm. um, may we treat every ecosystem with equanimity and may we rejoice in um, the actions that we see taken by others and by ourselves that help bring the earth to wellness. So these are this is an adaptation of the four immeasurables. So mm -hmm. just in ways like that, Buddhist teachers can start to turn the minds of their sanghas a little bit more towards um, towards changing inner individual actions. And that always progresses to things like how we vote, um, what kinds of um, demonstrations we go to, <laughs> what kinds of petitions we sign. Every little action we can take makes a difference. You know, I do think that's another thing that Buddhism brings to the table. This idea of interdependence means that we don't have to despair, that we are powerless. Everything we do makes a difference. Every little thing makes a difference. Mm, okay, cool. And, and um, David? I'm, I'm having, yeah, I'm, I'm having some trouble now uh, with reception. Uh, is it okay on your side, uh, but for both of you, are you able to hear each other and hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Could I also respond to, to your question Please. briefly? And if something goes wrong with the sound, you might need to give me a hand signal, Vince, if, uh, if I'm not coming through. Okay. Um, uh, s s there's an important sense in which I think the ecological crisis challenges Buddhism to clarify a kind of crucial ambiguity that I see being there from sort of the very beginning. Uh, I mean, I think this whole question of, uh, of how do we understand awakening, certainly the way the Theravada tradition understood it and, and developed it, uh, and, and, and not just Theravada, but the notion that this world is samsara, and the idea is not to fix, a, fix samsara or clean it up, but rather to escape from it, right? So the ultimate goal is not to be reborn. Now, by the way, I'm not sure how much that's. I'm not sure how much that was the Buddha's original emphasis or the way that the tradition developed. But uh, let's leave that to the side. Um, so, on the one hand, if that's your understanding, it does encourage us to sort of not be so concerned about what's going on here, because our ultimate goal is to check out. And maybe it's nice if other people will escape from this world as well, but not. Nonetheless, you know, my own individual salvation ultimately becomes separated from yours. So, so, so that's an issue that I think inevitably traditions, this understanding of transcendence tends to devalue this world to some degree. And, and, and I think that's, that's, part of the, the, that's part of the tradition. 
likewise, I think largely or at least partly in response to that, I, I think a lot of the way that Buddhism is being appropriated into the modern world is the emphasis sort of uh, a kind of therapy that helps us work with difficult emotions and sort of helps us fit into the world better. You know, so I'm I'm thinking of how it's it's quite fascinating. Whereas the Asian Buddhist traditions really weren't all that interested in our emotional life, frankly, and yet that's become a major preoccupation, I think, in 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 the in the West. And and it's very much the sense of our lives are very stressful, and something like mindfulness can help us um, uh, harmonize, fit in, and 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 make our peace of mind. And I guess I see both of these as problematic in that they tend to both extremes, whether we want to escape this world or whether we just want to fit into it better and, and sort of change the way our minds function so that we're more at, at peace with our jobs and family life and so forth. Both of those tend to overlook or minimize what I think are these larger questions. I mean, I don't see the Buddhist path as being either one of those. I, be, I see the Buddhist path as being about realizing that we experience the world in the way that we do and we experience and that includes experiencing ourselves in the way that we do because uh, we've constructed the world in a certain kind of way and so the Buddhist path is a kind of deconstructing with meditation deconstructing how we experience including ourselves and this works not only on the individual personal level of how we understand what it means to be an individual, what it means to be a person, but also collectively we need to look at the kind of restructuring that's necessary socially, politically, collectively as well. And, and so I see those deconstructions and reconstructions as, as two sides of the same thing, both the need for this Buddhist practice, contemplative practice works on reconstructing how we experience this world and likewise the traditional more Western concern for social justice is, is traditionally more concerned about restructuring how we live together and I just see those as, as two sides of the, of the same thing and I just wonder if, if, if the eco-crisis in particular really requires us to ask this question, how do we understand the relationship between our Buddhist practice and this world that we are in? Is it, is it escaping it? Is it fitting into it or what? And I think mm -hmm. that's just one of those unavoidable issues that comes to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Right. I found that, David, the um, doctrine of the, of the Bodhisattva who wants to come back again and again to be very helpful um, right. and very harmonious with the, with the perspective of not letting the earth die because we want to come back again and again and keep helping it, you know. <laughs> and so right, right. I found that to be a helpful uh, hermeneutic uh, for for sort of harmonious with this with this idea of enlightenment as not as a goal but as a process mm. and a long, long process. So. And the, the process-oriented mind, um, process-oriented view of the path maybe is, is one that could could help with that. And I also um, am thinking about these practices of, you know, I, so when you were saying escaping the world and getting away from suffering, I think there, of course, is a, a great deal of doctrine about that. But there's also a whole tradition uh, in, in, in Lochong, for example, Lochong being these uh, heart cultivation teachings out of the Tibetan tradition, in which your whole goal is to lean into what's difficult and lean into suffering and be even even come close as close as you possibly can to it because it is the door to love and compassion so you don't want to discard it you mm. don't even want to cleanse it mm. you want to be near it and allow it to feed your heart so that you become more compassionate so then suffering is not to be discarded from that from that perspective but I hear you <laughs> well you know, like, like you I'm fascinated by this by this notion of the new bodhisattva mm -hmm. uh, although I'm a little bit wary about the old way of conceptualizing or mythologizing it you know the notion that the bodhisattva out of compassion could sort of avoid rebirth but chooses to come back and to help the rest of us in a way it's like I I guess what 
the way I tend to think of it is a, as we begin to awaken and realize, uh, a, as we open up, you know, beyond the, the usual ego bounds, the sense that my well-being can be separated from everyone else, we really realize that uh, the practice, the pra it's like the next stage of practice as we do that in inevitably involves what you might call bodhisattva activity because the, the old tendencies, the old self-centered, self-preoccupied habits of mind, uh, they don't just disappear automatically because you have some opening or some moment of insight. So how does one trans begin to transform one's life? And I think that's where the bodhisattva path comes in as far as you know, we, we have to change our fundamental motivations and ask instead of what can I get out of the situation, we're asking what can I do to make this better? I mean, in a way, this fits in with this quotation that I probably quote too often from these Argadada, but I love it, yeah. right? When I uh, look inside and see that I am nothing, that's wisdom. Mm. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that's love. So my understanding of awakening is this, this sense of separation just becomes thinner and thinner, and we, we realize that, you know, as Dogen might say, all of this is my own mind. This is what I am. And the bodhisattva path is learning to live in a way that acknowledges and, and, and works for the well-being of the whole because the bodhisattva ultimately doesn't feel separate from the whole. Mm -hmm. but, that's a, but that's somewhat different than the old way of conceptualizing, you know, the ultimate goal is to escape. No, for, you know, certainly for me the ultimate goal isn't to escape. It's, it's the opposite. It's, it's the sense of separation that's the problem and it's more and more wanting to, to feel that, uh, more and more wanting to live in a way where you know, I'm I'm fully engaged because it's all me because it's not it's well being isn't separate from me. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that very well, but uh, I think I you said it beautifully. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I feel like too before we as I mean this is this is I think we've covered some I mean a tremendous amount of uh, ground already, but I, I feel like because this is Buddhist geeks, I, I I feel like I need to kind of make a plug too for um for for the wise use of technology in this endeavor. Um, you know, I know part of this conversation, and I think, and this is some of what Dave and I have discussed in the past, like when we talk about, you know, consumerism and corporate culture, and, you know, we, we sort of start looking at some of the roots of the problem, um, you know, that's brought us to this point, you know. Um, and really, the, I mean, the, the ecology started changing, you know, well before we knew it was changing. We were already shaping it, you know, when we were lighting fires and, you know, doing, you know, bringing domestic animals together, we were already shaping it, um, and now it's even more dramatic. But, you know, I, I've been really inspired by things like the bright green movement, you know, this, this movement of environmentalists who really embrace technology's capacity to, um, to respond to these issues or using it as part of the response, and maybe even a necessary part. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also been really inspired in the, in the, in the business sector by things like the, like the benefit corporation movement, you know, where people are building into their charters um, and they can actually get sued if they're not delivering on certain social benefits and environmental ones being, you know, part of that. Um, and I, I just want to make sure, you know, kind of being a bright green, um, you know, business. I, I love, I love business and what it's capable of as a system. You know, when it's not um, just being kind of used to grow no matter what and at, at whatever cost. Um, but, but actually, you know. To, to look at the ways we can utilize those systems as well, even though they've been part of the problem, they can also and probably need to be part of the solution. Um, yes, so indeed. Anyway, just just wanted to throw that out there for all the all the geeks that are. <laughs> well, for the for the, any of the geeks that aren't <laughs> able to attend the Eco Dharma conference in August, we are going to stream it live Ooh, from nice. Waterfall Mountain Refuge, streaming live using technology to bring people closer to this Great. conversation, bring people together. I think it's it's a wonderful, um, we have wonderful opportunities now that we can do these kinds of things. It's amazing. It, uh, I think you're exactly right, Vince, that, uh, you know, we definitely need new technologies. There's no questions about that. And and it's also fascinating. It's It's really such early days for the internet and all that. And I don't know that any of us have even the Google guys have any real sense of, of, of the potential here and the potential for all kinds of transformations, uh, including spiritual ones. Uh, it, it, it's one of the great, uh, it, it's one of the great openings, you know, 
when you look historically at how technologies have changed things, you know, it was it was print that created the Axial Age religions. It was sorry, it wasn't print, it was script. And then it was actually print that was very much connected with the development of modernity, Gutenberg and all that. And I think the transformation that the, the internet and these new digital communications and it, it's it's going to be just as great, and 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 it's it, it's really fascinating. At the same time, I guess the other the other concern I have is, if we simply see the solution as the as the discovery and application of new technologies, right. will that be sufficient to address what I see as the collective version of the individual problem? This, you know, if the individual dukkha suffering is 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 deeply connected with the sense of separate self. That, that I'm separate from you, it, it, it does seem to me too that what we're experiencing now is a collective version of the same thing where we as a species feel separate from the earth. So in addition to new technologies, we need new ways uh, of reconnecting with the natural world and feeling that we're not separate from it. I, I just think that both of those are, are, are going to be necessary. Yeah, that's huge. And you know, I was going to say the, the separation that I've seen dwindle as I go more into the technology space is the separation between me and technology you know mm -hmm. it's becoming easier and easier to create new forms of technology and they are an extension of our motivations and our intentions um, the way we design them and the way we use them reflects that so clearly and just like we're not separate from the natural world we're not separate from the technologies that humans create which are part of humanity which is part of the natural world <laughs> You know, so it's in some ways there. It's like no separations in all directions seems to be in some ways the like part of how we have to respond to this issue. I think my just th thoughts on technology are that it's an amazing tool, especially for for communication um, and a communication across distance, just like we're doing right now. I mean, amazing that we're all having this conversation about such. Mm such meaningful topics and we're not anywhere near each other. That's incredible. I also sometimes uh, worry about the dangers of technology um, with regard to the mind and attention and where attention is directed mm. and, um, and how much is it taking us out of the real world, how much is it taking us away from nature. So I was, I was you know, saying earlier that I, I was talking to a climate scientist who said she'd read a study in which they found that most people spend less than one hour a day outdoors and and that to me is 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 concerning because I think as a society we are suffering from nature uh, deficit disorder <laughs> that we could really do would do well to spend more time in communing with nature so that we really see these ecosystems as they're changing and care more deeply about acting on their behalf Mm. That's not. That's not a. Uh, a I'm not uh, dismissing technology, but more saying that uh, I. I always think of it as something to be indulged in moderation. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know, and this is something we've explored uh, ad nauseum on Buddhist Geeks is you know the, mm. the difference between criticizing technology as a whole and criticizing the way it's designed and the way it's utilized, um, yeah. because there are some beautiful technologies that can be used to to aid that very communing process. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my sense is that uh, from a Buddhist perspective, well, maybe this isn't the only Buddhist perspective, but that t uh, technologies aren't good in themselves or bad in themselves, but it all depends on, on context and intention. That, that, that you can't really take, you can't say this technology is is inherently bad or good. What's what's the motivation behind it? I mean, I mean, it's not so simple, but but I think that's a really important issue from a Buddhist perspective. Is one of the main questions we always need to ask is you know what what's the motivation, whether individual or collective. I mean, we also need to look at likely consequences, but I think that's what's really interesting about Buddhism is that it's it it it's emphasizing so much our motivations. Nice. Okay, cool. This is interesting. Maybe this feels like a whole other conversation. So I want, I want to, <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't want to um, go, go beyond our time, which we've already, which we've already, uh, you know, reached. But just to thank you for, um, 
yeah, your time and reflections and, and thoughts on this. And definitely would encourage anyone who's interested in uh, continuing this conversation or seeing where it goes, you know, to either um, go to Wonderwell and, and join David and Willa or to, you know, watch the live stream and, you know, uh, and I'll definitely be following this uh, with rapt attention and, and be curious to see how it develops over the, the next few years. Thank, thank you for this invitation, Vince. It, it, it's been a pleasure talking with both of you. Yeah, thank you so much, Vince and Dave, for being in conversation. This is wonderful. Thanks for having us on Buddhist Geeks. Cool. Good to have you. All right.